Stephen Kotler, welcome back to the Mindset Advantage podcast. It's been a couple of years. Welcome back to the show. It's good to be with you. Congratulations on another phenomenal book. I think everything you put out, man, is straight fire. I got a bunch of your books behind me. Nar Country is the newest one, Growing Old and Staying Rad. And that's what today's conversation is going to be all about, all about aging. We have a lot of coaches. We have a lot of athletes that are that are listening and tuning in every single week to the show, Steven. So let's first talk about, I like first debunking the myths. So can we first start there? What are the myths of aging and what are the things that most people get wrong before we get into what they should do? Let's first start with the myths. It's a great place to start. So the traditional theory of aging, which I like to call the long, slow rot theory is the myth you got to start with. So the long, slow rot theory is, is really the theory that we all grew up with, right? It's the idea that all of our mental skills, all of our physical skills, they decline over time and there's nothing we can do to stop this lie. And in its modern incarnation, that story starts with something Freud writes in 1907. He's, I think he's, it's, the book is on psychotherapy and he is about to turn 50 years old. He's terrified, terrified of turning 50. And he writes, you know, the human, something I'm paraphrasing, but basically the human brain after the age of 50 becomes so rigid, it's no longer educable. Don't even try therapy with people over 50. And he says this, you know, in 1907, never mind the fact that he goes on to write like three of his most important books in his 60s. Like nobody ever talks about that. It was sort of off to the races. And by the mid 90s, all we had done in exacting detail is prove Freud right. Right. And at, like every single thing we knew, how it declined, how it crashed, how we were fucked, all that stuff. And then right around then, Studies started overturning a lot of these ideas. Now, a lot of these were older studies that gotten started in the 70s. Unlike you want to study longevity, you got to do 20 year studies, that sort of thing. So some of those studies first start coming of age. Then we get a bunch of the giant deve adult development studies, the Harvard, the two Harvard cohorts, it's 100 year studies and the Terman cohort at Stanford. That's another 80, 80 year study. Those things start to show up and slowly between then and now, Every single thing we used to believe about aging gets overturned, though most people don't know this part of the story. But the short version, and then I'll just stop and go, go to the next spot. The short version is everything that we used to think declined over time, we now know it is a use it or lose it skill. And if you continue to train these skills, you can hold on to them, even advance them far later in life than anybody thought possible part one part two is and again we can cover in greater detail turns out because of changes in the brain in your 40s and 50s you actually come into a whole bunch of cognitive superpowers in the second half of your life that are literally not available uh, until then so the idea freud's big idea was you can't teach an old dog new tricks that's where this starts that's what freud says and what all the research now shows and this is sort of gets us up to where in our country starts in a sense is that, no, no, that's not true. In fact, old dogs can learn new tricks. And in certain cases, with certain kinds of tricks, especially if trained properly, they're even better at it than young dogs. So that's where we are now. And that's sort of the biggest myth. Um, I'm going to puncture a couple others as we go along, but we, I'd be jumping way ahead and have to fill in too many details and we'd get confused. I love it. I think I want to pick apart the where you say as we enter our fifties, we gain a superpower of cognitive. Go 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 into that. That what what is so profound? Yeah, that's about the this, so this is this is uh, credit where credit is due. Bunch of people worked on this, but the person who put it all together and really really drove it home is, is Dr. Gene Cohn, who's a giant. He's I think of him as one of the two godparents of the field that is now peak performance aging, along with Ellen Langer, who is at Harvard. I think she's the other. And um, I'm sure as we talk about mindset later on, we're going to talk about Ellen, um, of course. But uh, um, Gene Cohn is the first head of the National Institute of Aging. He's the one who basically says, hey, government, we've got an aging boomer population. Maybe we should study this, right? This is a problem. And uh he, he does. And what he figures out is, well, he takes some ideas borrowed out of neuroscience. He was predominantly a psychologist and realizes that there are these shifts that happen in the late forties. First, there's certain genes that only activate with experiences, mm -hmm. right? We call this epigenetics, but at the time it's, you know, it's genetics. Um, second, 
this is sort of in the era of brain plasticity where they're first discovering, oh crap, brains can learn, older brains can learn. It's not this lock-in syndrome with neurons dying off and, and nothing we can do about it. And in fact, um, not just that, but the two halves of our brain, which essentially work in opposition for most of our lives, start to work together like never before in our 50s. Mm -hmm. And finally, the brain starts to recruit underutilized regions. Oh, you've never learned how to play the trumpet. So we got this spot in the temporal lobe that would normally go for that. But no, no, we could use it to store X, Y, and Z, right? All this stuff starts happening in our late 40s and early 50s. The results um, is we're getting access to whole new levels of intelligence, three new thinking styles that are essentially off limits beforehand come online for really for the first time. We, we sort of put away black and white thinking. We start to realize everything is really a very complicated, nuanced shade of gray, uh, multi-perspectival thinking at a whole new level so we can see around a problem. Our ego starts to quiet. We can now see really round problems. That starts to happen. Um, Big picture thinking at a level that is really not possible before comes online. As a result, not only do we get these three new levels of like measurable intelligence, that's cool. We also get whole new levels of creativity, including divergent thinking and divergent thinking that's outside the box thinking, right? Very hard to train, really hard to train. And we get it for free. You also gain whole new levels of empathy, really important and wisdom and wisdom it should be pointed out is a really clear definable neurobiological trait with a lot of sort of innate superpowers built in that i'm sure we're going to talk about as we go along but you get level of wisdom that really matters for peak performance aging that you couldn't access before so all this stuff starts to come online in our 50s and you start to realize oh wow there are there are things i'm going to be better at learning than before wow so I'm 30, Stephen Collar, and I'm thinking about, okay, there's three types of thinking relative to what you went through this realistic, non-dualistic, and then systematic. I'm thinking as I'm sitting here talking to you, is it possible for me as a 30 year old to start to adopt these earlier, maybe get ahead of the crowd. And then by 50, I'm ahead of my peers. Is that possible? Can you train it? Can you do so that? Let's not the, the the epigenetic stuff is impossible without the okay. experience mm -hmm. uh the two halves of the brain working together seems to be something that is developmental um and same thing with the recruiting of underutilized regions though there's probably more flexibility in that one i have to say um but i could be talking about I, i'm guessing but that one might have more flexibility that is not to say you can't do those things earlier i and like for example and i know this about myself being a writer, being a, somebody who writes books, writing books demands holding, you know, 500 pages in your head. You have to learn a particular kind of big picture thinking to write books because you have to move parts around in, in, in ways. And I know other people, like it's trainable skill that other people can't do because I see what, you know, I, I go meet with other writers and I can do things with their book outlines that they just can't do yet because they haven't written 14 books, right? So that kind, you can train up some of the thinking styles for sure, but let's let's back up because you, you almost got to the great question. Let me actually get to the great question from where you started because there's other things you need to care about. So one of the myths about peak performance aging is that, it's for people who are, I don't know, over 50, over 60, over 70, over 80. And that does not appear to be true. In fact, those superpowers we've been talking about are not, they don't just come to you. You have to do certain things to unlock them. And these are the gateways of adult development. There's stuff you have to do in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and then, you know, again, 60s, right? Uh, to keep, to hold open this up and hold on to it. So like in your thirties, by 30, you really need to have solved the crisis of identity. You gotta sort of know who are you, where are you going? What are your values? What are your strengths? You don't have to know all of your purpose, but you gotta have some understanding of, of passion a little bit, and as, at least as a directional. Um, by 40, match quality starts to really, really matter. Now this, when we talk about these adult development gateways, adult development is not like childhood development. Childhood development is automatic. Like you go through your terrible twos, you're gonna rebel as a teenager. This, all this stuff happens automatically. As an adult, it's not automatic. You have to do the work yourself 
And if you don't, what suffers is quality of life, overall life satisfaction, meaning, purpose, enjoyment, those things you'll never get to what your potential is without solving these challenges. So identity by 30, by 40, it's mass quality, which can mean it, it really it translates in an economics term that translates into a, like a link between who you are, your identity, which is why you got to solve that by 30 and what you do with the bulk of your time, right? Your vocation or your avocation doesn't have to, doesn't have to be, uh, you don't have to do what you love for work, but you have to be able to spend a lot of time on what you love um, for certain. And, uh, and to put it differently, you know, this is very in line with a lot of research I do. You have to live with passion, purpose, and flow. Right? By, by age 40, it, you have to be regularly, like you can't waffle anymore. And by 50, this is where things start to get interesting. You actually have to forgive yourself and forgive all those people who have done you harm, um, which is very tricky, but forgiveness really matters. Um, in fact, without it, you can't get the empathy and the wisdom. And you may not even be able to get the multi-perspectival thinking in a, in, a, in a bunch of those other things. You can see sort of how these traits might be linked neurobiologically, and they they are. So, um, and then once you even get to your 50s and get these superpowers, if you want to hang on to them, you have to continuously train down risk aversion because risk aversion increases over time. And it has tons of negative effects, including it blocks creativity and it blocks empathy and it blocks wisdom. And in some cases it can harm intelligence. And so like that's gotta happen. And simultaneously you have to train up physical abilities. We talked earlier, all these are user to lose it skills. The, the big point is like, what good is superpowers in the brain if your body is falling apart? And we now know, oh my God, you can hold on to much of your body until very late in life provided you're training properly. So peak performance aging, and there's obviously, we could talk about some diet stuff and some lifestyle stuff and you know, way more stuff that we can fill in what has to happen earlier in our thirties. We're just gonna start there with this big sort of psychological arc and I'll shut up and let you ask your next question. But there's more to that that point. That's another myth that peak performance aging starts when we're older. It doesn't. What's the advice, Stephen, to the 30-year-old out there who's listening and they're, or maybe it's, sorry, maybe it's 35, 40-year-old, but they don't have the 30-year mark yet figured out that identity piece. Do you have advice on that, what they should be doing, what that looks like? It's a tricky one because um, identity is complicated. It's individual. Um it is there's there's great tools to help figure out your strengths right there's great tools to help figure out your values um i've created a bunch of great tools to help you identify passion and purpose and and what leads to flow so those tools exist right now that's not the whole of identity because you have your culture you have your sexuality you have your etc 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 all that stuff so you got to bring a bunch of stuff to the table. What's funny about this? Here's what's funny about this: is identity and the identity crisis. This is Aunt, this is Eric Erickson who proposes it, the first one, right? And he's trained by Freud. So this is not a new idea. Mm -hmm. and Erickson says that the identity crisis shows up around age twelve, and it's solved by eighteen. What I find fascinating is it no longer solved, solved by eighteen. Mm -hmm. Not even, not even close. Like first of all, like. I could tell you flat out, like, good God, at 18, did I have any clue who the hell I was besides like like being an arrogant punk rocker that you probably didn't want to mess with? <laughs> you know, other than that, like, I don't, I don't know what else I got to say. Um, so I really, I either like Erickson got it wrong or like we just don't mature as quickly as we used to 50 years ago, or I don't know. I find it interesting. Um, I will also say, and and I don't like, this is, I always say that my job is to get people from, from sort of normal up to Superman. That's the work I do. There's an entire field called psychology that is about fixing the broken, getting people from subpar back to normal. And I'm not great at that stuff. So I'm going to pass on this question because I sort of try to stay in my lane. I love it. One thing that you do have nailed down, and it's my favorite part of the book, I'm so curious to pick your brain for, for several minutes on this, is the mindset of aging. The quote that mm -hmm. just spoke to me, Stephen, is aging is a fact, 
old is a mindset. And then you mentioned Ellen Langer says aging is as much mental as much as a mental event as a physical process. Let's just start there and see where we go. Why is the mindset of aging so damn crucial? So people always ask, where do I start with peak performance aging? And somewhere, don't let me get off your show before I give you peak performance aging and a formula for you. Cause that's the next myth of aging that we, we need to puncture, but, but that's not where you start. Where do you start? You have to start with mindset one. What's the upside. Then let's talk about what's the downside. And then let's talk about what. We're, so one, we know, and Ellen Langer actually is the one who figured this out so many years ago, started to figure this out. There's now 50, 60 years of work that backs her up that a positive mindset towards aging. And this, by the way, the mindset of old is very simply defined. When the voice in your head starts saying you're too old for this shit, that's the mindset of old. Like that's it. For a lot of us, that can show up in our late 20s. Forget 50, 60, 70. Like that's late 20s, early 30s for people. Absolutely. Right. So, and it's really insidious. And let's let's talk about pros and cons. Pros, you get it right. I have a positive mindset towards aging. I think my best days are ahead of me. I think the second half of my life is going to be filled with exciting possibility. Translates to an additional, and this is extremely well validated, eight years of healthy longevity. It's the single biggest lever we know of. The single most important thing is a mindset. And what's the downside? So Ellen Langer has a student, prize superstar student, Becca Levy, who now teaches at Yale. Becca's worked on this under with Ellen and, and for on decades on her own. She's brilliant. Um, Becca works a lot on aging stereotypes. So what happens if you... A, have a shitty mindset towards aging, or B, are exposed to ageist stereotypes. And let's point out that ageist stereotypes are the most socially acceptable stereotypes in the entire world. And I can walk out my front door, and if I were to say anything stereotypical about anybody in the universe, I would be canceled by the time I got to my mailbox. But like, I can look at you and be like, dude, you're just too old for this shit. It doesn't matter how old you are. You're laughing, right? You're laughing and it's funny and nobody cares. That's true. And yet, That's so check true. out the penalty. Check out the fucking crazy penalty. So if you were exposed to a negative mindset, it's aging or, 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 or ageist uh, concepts and you grow up with them by the time you get to 60, 60, you're not even old. You're at 60. This is still middle age, according to how we work the numbers today you will suffer 30% greater memory decline mm. than somebody with a positive mindset towards aging or somebody who wasn't around, raised around age of stereotypes. That's 30% memory decline is insane. If, I mean, that's, that's, that's a mental health crisis on par with like the vegetative Alzheimer's and like real cognitive decline. It's crazy. Um, so big penalty, big benefit if we get it right. And, um, Interestingly, sort of this is the work I've, I, I, I've been, been involved in. This is sort of one of the things NAR country is about. It's an experiment in peak performance aging designed, among many other things, to absolutely explode one's mindset towards aging and replace it with something very positive. And the reason is Ellen Langer did some great work on mindset years back. And she said, if you want to change your mindset, two things really matter. You have to pay mindfulness is what is what she said but her definition of mindfulness is different than what most people think it's uh it's basically paying attention to the now with as much curiosity as possible um that's what she means by, by mindfulness and what she really wants you to notice is that change is a constant in life the brain and the mind and the self shield us from this Right at every level, as you have no idea looking at your body that every cell in your body is going to replace itself within seven years. Just like your memory of yourself at 15, you think it's coherent from 15 to 25 to 30, right? Like you think you're the same person and, and you're really not. And we know this it's well documented, et cetera, et cetera. So self is sort of this fabric that, that, that we hold on to and change is actually the law of the land everywhere. And oh, Ellen says, notice that. No, you'll be less fearful about what's coming if you realize that this is all the time and that these ideas of stasis are wrong. Two, obvious one, police your language, right? Watch how you talk to yourself. Watch how other people talk to you, but really police your own language. And then 
what we added to that, because that's as nice as it sounds, it'd be great if those two things would actually shift a mindset, but it's not true. And it's not true. The fixed mindset going from fixed to growth. It's not true going from a bad aging mindset to a good aging mindset. What you usually have to do is prove it to yourself. We got really good built-in bullshit detectors. And usually we have, when we shift a mindset, we have to prove it to ourselves that it's real. So peak performance aging, I suggest a NAR style. We'll talk about what the word means in a, in a minute, but like a difficult, challenging, somewhat dangerous, perhaps quest that on the other side of whatever you thought was possible in the second half of your life, you've just exploded those ideas, right? That's sort of what the book is a little bit about. Prove it to yourself. I love that, man. There's a lot of people, Stephen, that come to me, they want to gain more confidence as a, as a mental performance coach. That's something I work with a lot. And, and the quote that's going around the internet is it's not just staring in the mirror, shouting affirmations. No, it's outworking your self doubt, putting yourself out there and proving to yourself that you can overcome hard challenges. That's how you gain confidence. A little bit of a side note, but I, I want you to dive more deeper into proving it to yourself. That's so good. Well, one, let's talk about why affirmations fail and gratitude work. Yeah. Because affirmation, yeah. like, like, like those are a fucking disaster. So you, same reason, we're same thing. Your brain has a built-in bullshit detector. So if you're looking in the mirror and going, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire. And the guy looking back at you is going, bullshit, you work at Walmart, motherfucker, right? That's incredibly demotivating. That is so demotivating, right? That's really demotivating. That's not, that's not going to help. It's not helping. That's not helping the job, right? And um, it's really true. Gratitude works because you're grateful for stuff that's real. I am so happy and grateful that my legs worked this morning and I got out of bed. I am so happy and grateful that I have food to eat and a roof over my head. This is real stuff. And your brain goes, oh, everything's not so terrible. Look at these real stuff you're pointing to. Maybe we don't have to be so on guard and we can let in some more positive information instead of all that negative information that we've been looking for all the time. That's the, the difference here. This is sort of the same thing. You have that same Bolton bullshit detector and all of us, one way or another, in the, I don't know where you could have grown up where you were not exposed to the, like, the long, slow rot theory on one level or another. And the only people I know who don't suffer that are the people who have already proven them to themselves that is bullshit, right? And um, so I just, all of it to me is about proving it to yourself. Well, you know, I I always say that like when we train people in what we call the habit of ferocity, which is the ability to like lean in automatically to challenges. One way you know you've got it and you've done it is when somebody says to you, hey, what's been going on? What have you done that's been up to the past six months? Which are conversations we'll all have from time to time and you start listing shit. And, you know, I did this and I did this and I did And suddenly when the, like the list that pours out of your mouth and answers that question shocks you, yeah. Now, now you've got, that's what we're talking about, right? And um, there's a flip side to this that I think is equally important. And I'm, I'm glad to hear this quote going around the internet. Because one of the things that people also don't do is a common peak performance training mistake is they don't believe their own history. So when they look for strengths, right? They take strength finder rather than looking at their own like invisible skills. I'll give you a simple example. So I was a bartender before I was a, journalist before I was anything right and um being a bartender means I you have to like me and tip me well for me to pay my bills so I learned to talk to anybody to listen to anybody to make everybody laugh and to be everybody's friend mm -hmm. because that was how I paid my bills and I got very good at it and so that's an invisible skill when I moved into journalism as a skill I already knew I could talk to anybody at any station in life from billionaires down to folks on welfare. And I got along with all of them. I could, I could, I could do all of that. That's an invisible skill. It doesn't really show up on a strength finder test or what, whatever, but people don't notice that stuff. They don't notice their own invisible skills and they don't trust their own history. And that's a huge mistake, right? In, in one. Um, and the other thing is they don't realize that you can't mindset is, all this stuff is stuff you have to prove to yourself. You're the highest barrier, right? And um, certainly like trying to prove it to other people. I was just spending some time with family and it's amazing to me. 
they lock you in. Like they, they know you're eight, you're 18 to them, right? You're sort of locked and you're never like those things. Don't even try proving it to other people, right? Like the people you want to prove it to, don't even bother because they're already, they, they've already made up their mind because they're fixing, like when the reality of your life proves it to them, they'll sh change as well, right? So usually when people are like trying to prove this to other people, it's the, prove it to themselves and the other people will notice is the better plan anyways. Wow, that was a wild tangent. That's a great that's a great piece of advice, though. Another uh, story or study that you told on another podcast, I thought was really cool. And I think it fits in with what we're talking about with the mindset. It was the the counterclockwise study. Stephen, do you remember this? Oh, yeah, it's Ellen, Ellen Langer's can, famous. Can you study. talk this about this? The, yeah, this is the craziest mindset study known to man. So NAR country tells the experiment, tells the story of a peak performance aging experiment. I think it's the most radical experiment I've ever run. The second most radical experiment in peak performance aging ever run is run by Harvard professor, Harvard psychologist, Ellen Langer. Little context is helpful because otherwise it just seems really weird. Ellen Langer gets her start in psychology in like the early 70s. And she's, this is at the time that we're learning things about cognitive bias and framing and language and she starts to wonder because she's done some really strange studies that sort of poke at um aging as much more of a like as a functional language like how we talk to ourselves and how others talk to each other I, well i can go into the experiments if you want but it leads her to do this radical experiment called the counterclockwise experiment she takes 16 70 to 80 year old men loads them into a van at Harvard, drives them like two hours north to a monastery in the woods, kind of an upper Massachusetts, maybe up in New Hampshire, I'm not, I can't remember. And um, the monastery has been decked out. This happens in 1981. The monastery looks, been decked out to resemble 1961. She's turned back the clock 20 years. All the magazines are from 1961. All the books are from 1961. They watch movies, but they watch movies from 1961. And people get divided into two groups. One group has to reminisce about 1961. Oh, 20 years ago, I was this and I was that. And, I was... and then the other group has to pretend it's 1961 and act as if. So, you know, they're treating the Cuban Missile Crisis as if it's ongoing and, and, and that sort of thing. And they measure everything you can possibly measure in people from psychological stuff to intellectual stuff to all kinds of blood work and eye exams and ear, everything you can possibly measure. They measure pre and post. And the group, both groups actually improve, and we can talk about why in a second, but the group that pretended to be 20 years younger their improvements were, they were absurd. Their gait changed. Their height changed because so much arthritis went away. Wow. They got taller. Their wow. fingers got longer because of arthritis. They improved their IQ. Their eyesight improved. Their hearing improved, et cetera, et cetera. There's this famous story at the end of the experiment. Like when they load them onto the bus in the beginning, they can barely walk. Like they're getting on with canes and they can barely walk. And they're like, and at the end, Right before they get back on the bus to come back, there's a there's video of it. There's a touch football game that breaks out. Get out of here. <laughs> These are 80 year olds playing touch football, waiting for the bus to take them back to Harvard five days later. So this is where and and and, and by the way, this is one of these crazy studies where everybody goes, well, well, there's a million compounds and this is bullshit and there's no way it could be real. And so um, they don't just redo the study like five times. They redo the study. Three of those times are for television shows in Europe, where they like follow everybody around on a camera crew because nobody believes it's going to happen. Uh, at the front end of COVID, I don't know what happened to it because it got COVIDized. Um, they re Ellen redid the study with like full modern double blind standards and a whole bunch of new uh, new medical metrics. Um, but I haven't seen the data from that yet. Uh, but that's the counterclockwise study, and it's to me that's really where. That's the peak performance aging sort of gets its start. In, it's, it's twofold. I think it's the counterclockwise study followed by, and, and by the way, these are all happening, right? Gene Cohn's work, right? This is all roughly starting in the same era and, you know, culminating where we are today. 
I have two follow-ups. The going back a little bit, you talked about policing your language, and I know that's not as important as proving it to yourself. But I do believe there's a huge component of how you talk to yourself. I'd be curious, Stephen, from your from your point of view, um, what are some? I just really like to get tactical here. What are some of the phrases that you go, mm, maybe we shouldn't, and maybe this is what you should say instead? What are some red flags that most people think, hey, it's okay if I say this, and you're sitting there, Stephen, going, no, this is the shit I'm trying to get you guys to stop saying. Well, like any kind of limiting beliefs. Um, now, this does not, the brain for the same affirmation, gratitude, it doesn't respond well to magical thinking. That's not, that doesn't tend to be really well. But what the brain sort of likes is when, you know, you say things like we've all had arguments with our, with our significant others where you kind of go, oh, shit he's right or she's right and i just didn't see that right we we know that so the brain sort of likes it because we can be negative all day long and the negative is going to pop up automatically and you know that goddamn bitch i can't believe and you know you know it's the david foster wallace is you got to pause and you know are you sure like maybe she's rushing to the hospital because her dad is sick or may right like those are the kinds of like i just play the are you so certain game are you absolutely sure do you have enough uh another one that i like to monitor uh and when we do this i do this a lot when i'm working with artists because fear really blocks creativity and so you have to really monitor that uh but oftentimes uh you know we, we get anxious about things that are that haven't happened yet and the only thing i always tell people is maybe but it, do you have all the information you need to be anxious? Like, are you anxious about a medical test that you just took today? Cause you don't get the results for two weeks. Like you should be anxious in two weeks, but like, there's no, like there's zero, there's nothing. You're just being anxious to be anxious at this point and burning calories. So isn't it possible that you could, you know, have some other approach for the next two weeks and save that. I played those kinds of games uh, in my head a lot. I find, you know, they can be useful for other people, but that it's, I just, I get, when I hear myself making like hard and fast statements about declarative statements, especially negatively tinged declarative statements, I have just sort of trained myself to go, are you sure? Mm. I love are that. You, are, yep. I love that. Are you sure? Right, just, gonna, that, just steal, that. Are you I'm sure? Gonna, I'm going to steal that from you. You touched on a topic that I have written down that I wanted to get to. And I think now's a great time. Fear, flow and fear. Talk to me about how can people and athletes use flow to overcome fear? I think people listening, they might mm. want to do some of these things in our country, climb mountains, do this stuff, but there's a fear component. I know you have a lot to say about this. Talk to me and teach me about why, why is fear such a vital part of this process? So we got to talk about fear from, uh, So a little bit of fear, fear is essentially norepinephrine and cortisol neurobiologically, right? And a little bit of norepinephrine is essentially curiosity. And it's really healthy. It primes the brain for learning, focuses attention. Totally great. If that knob gets turned up a little bit higher, now you have significant problems. In fact, there's no greater performance killer. Fear does a number of things that are really tricky but the the short version is the more fear we produce the more logical and linear the brain wants to be so the more scared we are the brain doesn't want you know when you're facing a tiger in the brush the brain doesn't want a creative solution it wants something tried true automatic works 100 percent of the time now this is a it's a spectrum like everything else the extreme version is fight or flight right where the, the situation is so fucked you've got two choices Right. And that, and the brain's going to three actually the three is, but the brain's going to limit it to that. What most people don't realize is that any level of anxiety will limit those choices because the portion of our brain that does that is the anterior cingulate cortex. It's the portion of our brain that also does divergent thinking. And so it's, if you are, this is fearful time stress, for example, the brain, it doesn't give me something logical and linear. Don't go find a far flung idea that I write. Like, so this is, this is sort of built in. So too much fear. First of all, it blocks creativity. It blocks learning 
also, right? It hampers a little bit, primes us for learning. Too much completely blocks learning. It slows down fast twitch muscle response. It often limits the strength governor, not allowing you to access your, your full strength and power. And, and I can go on and on and on. And, um, but, 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 when it comes to peak performance, one of the most important things is focus. Flow follows focus. If we want more flow in our life, we got to learn to keep all our attention right here, right now. And fear is a phenomenal focusing mechanism. So I, peak performers learn to use fear as a compass. They will literally say, well, what scares me the most? Let's go in that direction because it's wow. going to give them focus for free, right? That's a huge deal, right? In, we, I, this is a peak performance sort of fundamental, but I, I was trained people in this. Grit is a last resort. It's not the first thing you want you want you want to turn towards you. There's a whole bunch of other motivators you want first: curiosity, passion, purpose, autonomy, master. All these things. Why they give you focus for free, right? If you have to be gritty, if you're trying, struggling to pay attention, you're burning so much energy. But if you're getting focus for free, so a little bit of fear is good. Or you know you have to just learn to work. You know you same thing with training down risk aversion. You got to scare yourself on a regular basis. Laird Hamilton years ago said to me, I try to do one thing once a day that scares the shit out of me. And I think that's about right. It doesn't have to be a physical thing. So it doesn't have to be an emotional thing, a spiritual thing. I, it doesn't matter. But I like, I try to scare myself sort of once a day in some way. And, you know, okay, I can still do that. Good. I would love to hear your advice about to an athlete too. Maybe it's a snowboarder about to go down the hill. Maybe it's a speaker about to go on stage. Maybe it's a football player about to take the field on a Friday night. The fear is high there. And what it sounds like to you is that there's a spectrum. We can kind of turn this knob down. What's the applicable advice to turn down so, the fear? Following questions. I mean, you, so it, how much time do they have? Uh, and so there's some personality stuff. If you have a... One, it should not be at that level, right? You should not be anything. You need to tune your nervous system on a daily basis. And that means regular mindfulness, gratitude, and exercise. And what I tell people is under normal conditions, do one a day, right? A gratitude practice is five minutes long, mindfulness practice, 11 minutes for stress reduction, right? Or 20 to 40 minutes of exercise. Do one a day. If you're stressed, do two. If you worked for my company during COVID, because we're a peak performance company and I want my people to be at their best and people were turning to us for help, right? So it really mattered. Uh, I wanted you to do three a day. So I demanded that like you exercise, you do gratitude, you do mindfulness every day. Some people, uh, in fact, uh, I would, if you depends on how you are, what I would do is I would read a book for six minutes because reading a book for six minutes is a more effective stress reducing tool than anything I just listed. Wow. Now, that's in advance. Sure. What do I do in the moment? Yeah, I'd love to hear. In the moment, uh, I, I'm, I'm still trying to, to make sure my exhales are twice as long as my inhales and my inhales are at least three to four seconds long because I'm trying to train down the sympathetic response and train up this parasympathetic. I will, that usually takes about six, seven minutes. It's not a fast thing. If you really want to zero out the nervous sex system in a second reframing is very fast so you can often turn anxiety into excitement because they're the same thing by literally just saying i am excited i am excited i am excited and it like that is often enough you can also and uberman's work at stanford he's done great work on how peripheral vision i write about this in our country if you look at the world out of the corner of your eyes that automatically activates the parasympathetic system because that we don't when we're when we're focused right tightly focused that's a fear response i'm staring at the thread in front of me but when we're checked chilled out and checking out things with the scenery right in the corners of our eyes the brain goes oh you must be calm you're checking out the scenery there's probably not a thread here and it calms you down very very quickly so all of those things work you know really well and i've seen like and I can't tell you, everything's individual. And the reason I'm hesitant here, I'm thinking of a conversation I had with Olympic snowboarder Gretchen Bleeder once where she was talking about her actual gold medal run. And she was in the start gate and having a lot of trouble focusing. And she switched the focus and, and used gratitude in the start gate and made it not about her and about everybody else. And that worked for her. So I always tell people when it comes to these kinds of fixes, 
test them out because everybody's really individual, right? I just gave you a menu, but like figure out what works for you in what situation, right? And, and I will tell you like, there are things I can use skiing that I sure can't use when I'm fighting my wife and vice versa. You know what I mean? So like different tools for different different situations sometimes too. But I think it's really important. I always tell people, figure, figure out what you, which ones you need because you go into a situation, even if you know it's going to be stressful, it's really cool to be able to say to yourself, hey, this is going to be stressful, but I got some tools and I know which tool works best in these situations because I've proved it to myself before. This is, again, prove it to yourself and trust your history. Um, and the tools are, are much more effective. Well done. Great advice, man. I want to get into another great part of the book. And I'd really like for you to uh, just get some clarification for the listeners out there. Deliberate play, deliberate practice. This is really big for people. Can you talk and teach us about what that means for the people who haven't got the book yet? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is great. So this is part of, if you want to distill peak performance aging down into a formula, this is part of the formula. So this is great. Um, Let's start at the top, actually. Let's start with, we're going to start with wisdom and expertise. because So if you want to stave off cognitive decline, dementia, and Alzheimer's, lifelong learning matters. Super critical. This is where deliberate play is going to come in. But lifelong learning matters. Why does lifelong learning matter so much? Lifelong learning produces expertise and wisdom. Expertise and wisdom, both cases, and think about expertise is like skills and intelligence, and we know what it is. And wisdom is just like social intelligence writ large. And it's all the meta skills, the system level skills that surround tasks, right? So both expertise and wisdom, when we develop them, form really, really big diffuse nets, networks across the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is what's most vulnerable to cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, and dementia. It's the newest portion of the brain from an evolutionary perspective which makes the most vulnerable as a result that's the part you really want to protect if you want to protect the brain over time and expertise and wisdom lifelong learning matter and by the way this is another peak performance aging starts young thing you really want to start mastering like new skills in your 20s and 30s so that you have a stockpile of them by the time you get later in life so we talked about lifelong learning. If you want to learn the traditional, what most of us have heard about theory is deliberate practice. It's Anders Ericsson's, you know, great work. Anders was a friend before he passed. I, I like him quite a bit, though I've disagreed with him publicly for a long time. And, and we've gone back and forth on this uh, because Anders' work revealed that you need 10,000 hours of or so of deliberate practice, right? Deliberate practice is repetition with incremental advancement. Now, Anders himself said, hey, wait a minute, this is only true for certain kind of like a narrow bandwidth of skills like math studies or if you want to play the violin. And even then it's, you know, a lot wobblier or more complicated than Malcolm Gladwell presented when he presented those ideas to the world. That said, there were a bunch of challenges to Anders' work. Uh, one of them was mounted in my book, Rise of Superman. But beyond all that, one of the most fundamental was we've known for 40 years that deliberate play outperforms deliberate practice. And deliberate play is repetition with improvisation or formally repetition without repetition. You do the same thing you did last time and then you improv on top of it. Why does that matter? Well, number of reasons. One, there's less shame. There's less self-consciousness. There's less fear there's less all of that stuff first of all second of all when we are sort of improving and playing deliberate practice you need the more neurochemicals that show up during experience the better chance it'll move from short-term holding into long-term storage that's how memory works one of the ways so if you do deliberate practice if you do the thing and you do it perfectly right you're going to get a little bit of dopamine now that's good that will prime memory it's definitely helpful but deliberate play, you get a lot more dopamine because it's, it's it's more fun. There's a lot more motivation and you get a shit ton of endorphins, which are another feel good neurochemical. And normally we only get endorphins during extreme 
exercise, right? Or maternal bonding, mother, daughter, father, daughter, paternal bonding, that sort of thing. Um, those are the only times we normally get it, but you get it very readily from play, locks things into memory. So deliberate play massively outperforms deliberate practice. And it's twice or three times as critical in older adults. So park skiing, which is the, so in our country, I taught myself how to park ski, which is the very acrobatic version of skiing that involves doing jumps off, tricks off jumps and on rails and boxes. It's dangerous, it's super acrobatic and for about 12 different biological reasons, it's supposed to be impossible to learn once you're over 30. One of the main big biological reasons is we've got this developmental window for complicated motor skills and slam shut by the time we're 20, we've all heard about it and don't become a gymnast in your 30s kind of shit. And like a lot of these stories, there's some truth there, but there's a lot of falsehood. And what the falsehood is, is funny. It's not that the developmental window stands shut. It's that kids learn by playing. Adults learn by working. And it's a much harder way to learn. So deliberate play significantly outperforms deliberate practice. And it really matters for older adults. I would love to take it one step further. What What's an example other than skiing where an adult could uh, paint, just paint a more of a picture. What does it look like to practice versus play? You pick the, you pick the example. Uh, it could be anything. Uh, it could be the difference between studying flashcards to learn a foreign language and then like going to the park and sitting and talking to the abuelas, right? And when I needed to learn Spanish, to pass a fluency exam to get into grad school. That's what I did. A little bit of flashcards in the morning, but I like, I was living in the mission district in San Francisco back when that was still a very loud neighborhood. And I would just go to Dolores Park and talk to the grandmothers who would laugh at me, right? Cause my accent was funny. And like, and like that was really playful. I've got like 75 year old women laughing at me and correcting me and we're all having a blast and very playful and, you know, much easier way to learn Spanish had to do a little bit of deliberate practice to sort of prime my vocabulary, but that was where it sort of stopped. And then I just took it into the streets in a fun sort of playful way. That was also very useful for me because I don't like language classes. I don't like being bad at things in public. So I put myself in a situation where like, I didn't really mind being laughed at by grandmothers. Like that was, that was kind of cool. I thought that was, that was fun. You know what I mean? So that's just a random, but one. You talk a lot about the putting emphasis on the outdoors with playing. Why so much emphasis on the outdoors, Stephen? And if somebody's not into the extreme acrobatic skiing, what could the fifty or sixty year old pick up? Okay, so that? let's let's let, yeah, let's go to the full sentence for peak performance aging. Let's explode a mother myth around aging and let's break it apart and answer these questions. Peak performance aging in a single sentence based on 60 years of research, about five. Here we go. I'm ready. Papers, I'm ready. I got, right? I got my pen. Here we go. If you want to rock to your drop, you want to regularly engage in challenging, creative, and social activities that demand dynamic, deliberate play and take place in novel outdoor environments. That's the formula. So what are the first myth that gets busted up in there is nothing in that formula is a substance, is a pill, is a cold plunge, is a hot plunge. Like there's nothing, I, there's nothing anybody can sell you. None of those, that, that, that's literally um, everything in there is a psychological or physical trigger with huge neurobiological consequences underneath it. Most of them do double, most of those words do double duty as flow triggers because flow is fundamental for peak performance aging which is how one of the reasons i got into this work in the first place we can talk about that in a second but let's sort of break down we talked about so let's talk dynamic deliberate play i will go backwards dynamic is the first half of uh, of that equation and we talked about use it or lose it skills on the physical side that's the five that matter the most are strength stamina flexibility balance and agility the World Health Organization has been very precise about if you want peak performance aging, you need 150 to 300 minutes a week of vigorous aerobic activity for stamina, two strength training days a week, and three balance, agility, and flexibility days. Or you find a single 
dynamic activity that checks all those boxes at once. Skiing is a great one. So is tennis. So is badminton, for example. In fact, the Mayo Clinic did this really funny study where they wanted to know different based on different activities, what does it add to you, your life and longevity? And they joining a health club, right? Working on a health club, you get an extra year and a half. You take up jogging, it's 3.1 years. Swimming is 3.6 years. You want a really big boost? Go in for soccer, um, wow. which is about six years. And then we can talk about why that's the, the social component coming to roost right. there. And then you want to take it up further. It's badminton and tennis. Uh, and some of it has to do with hand-eye coordination, faster sure. muscle response. Mm-hmm. But the most important thing is dynamic motion and dynamic motion isn't just about training up the physical skills there's a bonus here this is the only we know exercise improves the brain right different kinds of exercise do different things in the brain it's not an across the boards everything fixes everything dynamic motion is very significant because when the brain has to couple strength and coordination basically at the same time which is dynamic it produces angiogenesis and neurogenesis the birth of new vasculature and blood vessels to support new neurons and new neurons right you hold on to your brain what do you need new neurons that's how we stave off cognitive decline kind of thing so really crucial here that's dynamic deliberate play and you know dynamic deliberate play in you know action sports and skiing and so and all that stuff and it's not that i think action sports are really important as we age it turns out that skiing is actually the most beneficial um of all of all sports it, it, outdoor activities and skiing in particular will add an extra 10 years to your life um and there's skiing is a weird sport because of how it loads the bone it's actually perfect for preserving bone density more so than almost any other activity. In fact, swimming, which a lot of older adults are told to do, is actually not good for older. I mean, that's not great because you're not loading the bones at all and bone density declines over time and with it brain function because the bones are the mineral storehouse for the whole body and the brain. Mm -hmm. So they're very tightly linked. You need to preserve bone function. But anyways, my point is I'm not advocating action sports for, I am advocating action sports for older adults, but the reason I'm doing it is because it's one-stop shopping. If you follow the WHO's guidelines without a single sport, it's two hours a day, five days a week, physical training, or at least an hour and a half. That is not light. I don't know that many people who have that kind of time. So unless you have that kind of time, you want to find single activities that, that tick most of these boxes. Even better if the activity can be outdoors. Why? That's the novel outdoor environments. Why does that matter? Two reasons, three reasons. Reason one, there are nine known causes of aging. Biological causes of aging. What do they all have in common is stress and inflammation. So anything that is a de-stressor and an anti-inflammatory is an anti-aging tool. So one of the reasons flow is so important as we age is because it completely resets the nervous system back to zero. Really important for this reason. So flow is directly an anti-aging technology. It also boosts the immune system in in, in sort of spectacular ways. But that's besides the point. My point here is a 20-minute walk in nature outperforms most SSRIs on the market. We know it calms us down, gives us that soft fascination, that alpha state in the brain. It's phenomenal as a de-stressor. Even better, we evolved as hunter-gatherers. Our brain is specifically designed, specifically designed to remember where important shit happened. So when we talk about neurogenesis, new neurons in the adult brain, most of those neurons come out of the hippocampus. That structure does long-term memory and map making. Place cells and grid cells are what's in the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex in that part of the brain. It does location. The brain is designed, hunter gatherers, where was that ripe fruit tree come springtime? Where is that warm cave come winter? Where is the cave to avoid that had the Siberian tiger, right? Like all those things we have, that's survival. So we're built to remember that. So when we have novel experiences in outdoor environments, it de-stresses us but it massively increases neurogenesis and it helps protect our brain. And novelty is a flow trigger. It's one, it drives attention to the now, produces dopamine in the brain, which drives focus, which drives flow. So that's that 
chunk of the form. And then the only front of it is uh, you want challenging, creative, and social activities. Challenging is about flow. We pay the most attention to the task at hand when it's challenging, when it slightly exceeds our skill set. And this is doubly important in adults and, and uh, also a flow trigger. So uh, challenging, creative, creativity, pattern action, link ideas together produces dopamine. It's another flow trigger and you need it to unlock the superpowers of aging. Finally, uh, social, this is the second to mindset. This is the biggest lever. So mindset will give you an extra eight years of healthy longevity. Uh, robust social life gives you an additional seven and a half years. Now, the next obvious question is, do they stack? Not entirely, right? You don't get 15 years, but it does seem to stack a, a, a bunch. And uh, maintaining a robust social life is real. It's not, I know tons of people. It's I have high quality relationships. This matters on a peak performance level. It matters on a, you want to lower fear and anxiety in your life. This really matters. Psychological safety, sort of everything across the boards. Peak performance, aging. It's not just, uh, it's the obvious, which is friends make us use our brains in weird ways. It's you're much like more likely to ask myself me a weird question, get me thinking in a weird direction than like me talking to myself kind of thing. So preserves a lot of cognitive function, also does a lot of stuff for our nervous system, de-stresses us on and on and on. So that's the full formula. And what's I love about this formula, um, I, I mean, I'm not, I just, I did some of the work, but a lot of people worked on this. But what I love about the formula is successful to all of us. Like there's nothing in there that like none of us can't start doing today, free of charge right now. Don't have to buy anything. Don't have to do anything other than, you know, what, what's required in there. And I think that that's phenomenal. That's exciting to me. The relationship piece is interesting. Is there any science Stephen, to maybe a simple piece of advice could be uh, hang out with people that are younger than you have younger friends. Is there some science? Well, so there is a, there is that, that's a direct piece of advice. This is getting more nuanced and some peak performance aging stuff. It is, it is well known that the societies where people live the longest and are the healthiest mm -hmm. are age friendly societies that are underpinned by cross generational friendships. Mm. So young people should be friends with older people. Older people should be friends with younger people. And across the board, these are the healthiest societies, the most well-being, overall life satisfaction, young and old, everybody's happiest. Um, most important when you're older because, and I can't emphasize this enough, you have to, that nobody likes saying this out loud, you have to make replacement friends. Most people tend to know people who are their generation. Mm -hmm. And so as you get older, that gen people die off and that thins out. And if you're not making replacement friends, it's a real problem. And I, and I, I get two. So I have a friend of mine's mom who literally is a hundred years old in a retirement facility. All of her friends are dead and she's dying of boredom because she, she didn't make replacement friends. And, I, and she's somebody I hear about all the time. And I have a very close friend who, um, this is a wild story and he's going to go unnamed, but he's one of the giant brains of the 20th century. He was a Titan and he was part of the group of 19, late sixties, early seventies science thinkers. They don't, this is the, the sort of the generation that produced like Carl Sagan and Heinz Pagels and those kinds of thinkers. Nobody thinks like these folks. It was a very it's an interesting window in time. And so We'll talk to this friend of mine. I work with him every now and then. You know, I'll call him up and be like, Stephen, it's so great to hear from you. Nobody's called me in a month. And I'll be like, I'm sorry, what? What did you just say? He's like, yeah, nobody's called me in a month. You're the first conversation I've had. And I'm like, what do you mean nobody's called me? He's like, all my friends are dead. Nobody's left. And nobody thinks like them anymore anyway. So nobody thinks like me. So there's nobody I even want to talk to. And it's like being on the other end of that is just insane. This is a, this, this man's a, giant in terms of like his contribution to the 20th century and it, it, it's amazing but it's a, so it's these are really strange conversations to have and i've had a you know i've seen it up close the data is really clear and um you know it's one of the reasons i think that there's a bunch of people who work at the flow research collective 
the vast majority of them are younger than me for this very reason. Cool. Steven, I like to close down my uh, shows by asking for a piece of advice. And coincidentally, these are the clips that I pull out that go absolutely viral. So no pressure on you, but I'm going to ask you, what's the number one piece of advice as we leave? What's the number one piece of advice that you would give to a 50 year old who wants to keep rocking until they drop? What's the number one takeaway? We gave a bunch today, but if you were just to send us off with one, what would it be? I got to go back to where we start. It's got to be change your mindset because there's, you can't do this work. It's got to start there. If for no other reason, you, you know, you guys, I'm sure have talked about this extensively on this program, but if you look at any kind of negative mindset, what does that really mean? It means the brain is not going to get active and do the work to learn from mistakes. If you don't have a positive mindset toward data, like your brain literally won't turn on. You can't even get in the ring. So I always say that peak performance in general usually starts with if you don't have an internal locus of control, I'm in control of my life. If you have a victim mindset, for example, um, you like peak performance is completely impossible. You're locked out. You literally, you cannot like forget about it. So I, always, I think you have to start this stuff with mindset, which, you know, as we talk about, means a little bit of mindfulness present, a little bit of language policing, but more than anything else, figure out. Okay, this is my mindset. Let's say and when I say explode it slowly, you don't have to do it all at once. In our country, it was my exploding my mindset for aging. It took it was, it was a two-year process, mm-hmm. right? That's a two-year journey documented in, in that book. Um, so this is not this is not gonna happen overnight. We don't explode mindsets overnight and replace them with, with new stuff, but I think you've got to start there. Awesome. Stephen, where can my listeners go to help support you? Obviously, the book is out. Where can I point them if they want to learn more uh, from you? So, uh, narcountry.com, the website for the book is really fun. There's a bunch of fun stuff, a bunch of the experiments we ran are, are videotaped and, and there. Um, Stephencollar.com, website, flowresearchcollective.com is, 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 is the company. If you're interested, if you want to train with us, it is getmoreflow.com and at Stephen Kotler on social media. Awesome. Stephen, thanks for coming back for round two. This was phenomenal. Thank you, sir.